Good evening to you. Now, I suppose you're all expecting to see the Mike Yarwood show. Well, I'm very pleased to tell you he's not coming on. <laughs> no! Sorry! In his last programme, and I hope it was, <laughs> Mike Yarwood was taking me off, so I've decided to take him off. <laughs> Hello, good evening, and well. And nice to see you, to see ya. Do you mean that most of silly really do? Well, did you miss me? It must be all of 45 minutes since I last appeared in public. Well, he seems like a nice boy, doesn't he? Oh, so. No, I mean, let's face it, I mean, she's past it anyway. Yes. What a beautiful day for doing something daft, like shoving a marrow through a letterbox and shouting, The Incredible Hulk's arrived. <laughs> hmm, Betty, this is a rude show. <laughs> Wait till you see the other arm. But I am the leader of a great political party, wasn't it? That was Joel, not particularly informative. Get off the pair of you. Go on, get off. Mike Yarwood absolutely dominated the 70s. There were only three channels then. I think we tend to forget that because we've now got Channel 4 and Satellite. There were only three channels. People in Britain sat down almost as a family to the same meal at the end of the day. We knew the characters. We knew the Robin days. We knew the Jimmy Savills. It was extraordinary. It was absolutely essential viewing. Right. How about that, then, if you please? Now then, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome to Jim will fix it. He wasn't just making up sailor things, so uh, that was all right. He'd have been very quickly hauled down if he had. <laughs> My crew was very powerful. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, does the Chancellor intend to bring in any more ludicrous taxes? Yes, as a matter of fact, I've decided to put a tax on goats in the Silly Isles. In other words, the Silly Billies. It's uncanny how well he gets my voice, in fact. My daughter was working in the kitchen in her flat and she thought I'd come in because she got the television on in the next room and Mike was on. It was quite extraordinary. Hello, children. <laughs> I'm Paddington Bear. <laughs> well, I'm not really. I'm Dennis Healy. <laughs> but with my policies, now and again, I have to disguise myself. When you saw somebody being very successful on television as an impersonator, um, it somehow gave a, gave a greater cachet to the idea of doing the teachers or your pals or whatever. And, of course, to be referred to, uh, even by a teacher, as the playground Mike Yarwood, that was, that was a medal. I just enjoyed my childhood very much. I enjoyed sport, but I did enjoy performing. I did enjoy imitating the man who brought the milk or the man who brought the bread. And all my aunties and uncles, would, when they came to visit, would be getting me to jump through hoops. So I was never nervous as a child. I was a cocky little devil, really. I, 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 I was quite confident. Um, but when I, when I got older, of course, I, I, I and actually started doing talent competitions, I would be physically sick before I went on. I've often asked myself why he put himself through so much pain. He enjoyed entertaining people. He enjoyed that. Uh, and I think he felt that the pain of doing that was, was well, part and parcel of it. If I hadn't known this person I worked with who knew this person called Roy Mayo, who worked at ABC Television, it may never have come together the way it did. He hadn't done any performances. He'd never appeared in front of an audience. He didn't know what to do. And I said, well, why do you want to be in show business? And he said, because I do impersonations. I bet you can't do that one, Derek Nemo. Oh, oh, well, I know. <laughs> there, you see, there was this chap, you see, and he went to work on an egg, and one morning it was very, very cold, and he couldn't get the eggs to start hearted, you see. <laughs> So he rang the local garage and the man said, try pulling the yoke out. And a bit, a bit late, a bit late, he came back and he said, how did you get on after you'd pulled the yoke out? And the man said, oh, all white. 
and they were brilliant. But he didn't know how to put them all together and he didn't know what to do with them. He just knew that he'd got this remarkable talent for impersonating people. I was very lucky to have somebody uh, take me under their wing like that. Uh, whereas, you know, it, some people aren't as fortunate as that. They have to go it alone and make their own luck. This contrasts your situation. <laughs> It is emerging into our affluent society's cause by this factious affluence of materialism. <laughs> you are? What do you mean a good impression of Malcolm Mugridge? I am Malcolm Mugridge. I don't only talk posh when I'm on the telly, you know. He took Manchester by storm, which rather surprised him, because Manchester was attracting cabaret acts from all over the world. It really was the centre of entertainment, I reckon, in the world. Manchester, when, when Yardwood was a boy, when I was a boy, and Vernon Manning ruled. The fellow goes to the doctor, he says, Doctor, I've been putting on a lot of weight, can you get, put me on a diet? He said, no, you don't need to go on a diet, I've got a new idea now. Instead of putting the food in your mouth, shove it up your backside. <laughs> so try that and come back and see me in a month. A month later, the fellow goes back to see the doctor, he's walking in like this. Doctor said, why are you walking like that? He says, it's all right, I'm just chewing a toffee. He did the real apprenticeship. He did the clubs and the pubs, the late night clubs and the rough pubs around the north. It was really rough, you know, and you're always greeted by the concert secretary with the same words. Are you the turn, lad? <laughs> and you would always say to the concert chairman, could I have the key to my dressing room? And he'd say, oh, you don't need a key, lad, just a penny. When I first started, the step turn sound was my big finish, you know. That was the thing that got me a lot of work, actually, because they used to say, we've got to get this guy who does step turn sound. Have you any idea what it's been like for me having to live with a dirty little man like you? <laughs> I'm not a dirty little man. I have a bath August bank holiday Monday, <laughs> whether I need it or not. <laughs> oh, Carl. <laughs> Is, is that what it's come to, Harold? You're going to have me put in a home after all I've done for you? I'll go and pack my things then. No, oh, Dad, no, no, you don't have to do that. I've already done it for you. <laughs> Mike always made me laugh. Mike could make me laugh just by pretending to be Eddie Waring without a word being said. He'd put that hat on, twist his face in some extraordinary way, and you were laughing. That, I think, is something the others don't have. Well, welcome to Jeep San Frontis. Jeep. <laughs> Everybody who is on stage has got to have a coping strategy for people who don't exactly like you. Welcome. <laughs> I'm laughing and I saw it in rehearsal. Welcome to Jeep San Frontis. It's a knockout, eh? He was brilliant. He would put another voice. If somebody heckled him and said, we've had enough of that, he would turn round at the Poco a Poco Club in Stockport. I mean, how can he heckle somebody who comes from the same village or town? And he just put them down very quietly, had a, a wonderful manner. One particular evening, I was doing Larry Grayson with a chair, the way he used to lean on the chair. And about 35 people walked in late with nowhere to sit. In other words, they sold... 35 tickets twice. So all these people are hovering around in the aisle and nobody knows what to do. So I'm standing there with as Larry Graves and looking at him. I've got nowhere to sit. Well, there's a chair here. And I handed the chair over the orchestra pit for someone to sit on. <laughs> well, you get fed up with the same position, don't you? I said to him, one day we're going to have to split up. And the time for doing that is the day that you play the London Palladium. Norman Vaughan was on at the beginning, came on at the beginning, he said, oh, we've got uh, Shirley Bassey and we've got so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and we've got a fellow that does the Prime Minister. No, 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 sit down, sit down. <laughs> no, please sit down, no, I mean... The audience has demanded famous names and famous people. That was easy for him. And that does include everyone, it really does. <laughs> The real brilliant Mike Harwood was doing people that, that perhaps the audience would never know. At times, I felt that when I was giving him production points, he was re were replying as me. And I would say, look, cut it out. And we, this is work. You don't start doing the impression, you see, because I don't think he could resist it. What we've got to do here is, right, first of uh, all, learn the bloody words, John. Oh, that's the first thing to do. <laughs> you, you will do that. Have you been drinking heavily? 
Not recently. <laughs> <laughs> I went with Dave Forrester, who was Ken Dodd's agent. I used to imitate Dave more than anyone else for people in show business. You know, nobody said, do Arrow Wilson or do Robin Day. It was, uh, do Dave Forrester. And because he was Ken Dodd's agent, I thought, uh, I thought, funny idea. It was really a bit like the sort of thing Bob Newhart would have thought of. And it was Dave talking to America and trying to explain to them what Ken Dodd does. You know, and he'd be saying... I've got a very big star here. I think would go very well in uh, in America. Ken Dodd. Dodd, yes. Uh, what does he do? What does he do? Well, he uh, he comes on and he says, um, "Nick knocky, Nick knack, Nicky knacky new." That's right. Well, I don't know what the hell it means. It, 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 it gets a laugh anyway. And then he says how tickled he is. Yes. And he has, he has, a, he has a tickling stick. No, no, a stick. Tickling stick. Bloody hell. Anyway, uh, then there's his diddy men. Oh, I'll cry. I'll see his diddy men. They're wonderful. Yeah. Well, they're like a uh, little bit. <coughs> no, no, no. Well, yes, I suppose they're midgets, really. But they're children, you see, but they're not midgets. Oh, they, you, yes, yes. Does he what? Does he sing? Oh, yes. I don't think they'd understand that in America. <laughs> One of the seven wonders of the world is Ken Dodd going on stage to do his act and coming off the same day. <laughs> hey! By Jove, young man, I don't think that was very funny. I don't think that was very funny at all. I've got a superstition that every time I perform, the last thing I do is Ken Dodd. By Jove! The thing is about Doddy is that he's so big. As I was walking in, you know, into the surgery, I saw this nun coming out of the doctor's surgery. White as a sheet, this nun. I said to the doctor, that nun didn't look too happy. He said, no, <clears throat> no, no. Just tell her that she's pregnant. <laughs> I said, well, is she? He said, no, he said, but it's cured her hiccups. <laughs> touchy bye, everybody, touchy bye. Good evening, but I'll soon put a stop to that. <laughs> Tonight, as usual, I will be asking difficult, embarrassing and impertinent questions. <laughs> And if I don't get straight answers, I will be persistently rude. The Impressionists do have a base colour. They're a natural accent, and so they're ear for people who share that accent. In the case of Mike Howard, I always thought that was a sort of Lancashire, Northern England um, accent. He was very, very much at home with. Oh, there you are, yes. <laughs> Incidentally, do you realise what happens if I remove these spectacles? <laughs> I'll show you. Well, there we are in the book. <laughs> I'm very bad at rehearsing alone. What I would do is just simply keep trying it out on people until they said, hey, you've got it. And once they said you've got it, that would be fine. Because they're hearing it different to me. They're hearing a different tone to me altogether. We don't hear our own voices as others do. Little Anne cannot make an appearance this evening because his wig has gone in for an MOT. <laughs> hey! Somebody come on. Oh. He had that advantage physically. Um, of having sort of the blank canvas face, um, not particularly strong features, the ability, therefore, to become characters. Mike has the ability to look at you and suddenly change his face, and that does it. So I think he's very good indeed. He can make you believe he really is the person he's impersonating. <laughs> ah, there you are. I'm glad I kept my eye on you. Now, tonight, I'm on my favourite subject, stars. I eat stars, drink stars, breathe stars, I sometimes even see stars. Mike himself, of course, is in his own right a star. And I wonder, I wonder, has anyone ever tried to impersonate Mike Yarwood? I wonder if it's ever been done. I used to take Mike Yarwood shows all the time, and I think there's still parts of uh, Mike Yarwood's impressions in some of mine. I mean, when you do Frank Spencer, I mean, there's still that sense of... Uh, you're doing an impression of Michael, really. You're not doing an impression of Frank, you're doing an impression of Michael. You talking about me? <laughs> I look in the mirror. Hello, Betty, Jessica. Mm. I much prefer to see the tape play back because you're getting a reversal anyway. You're looking in the mirror, you're seeing things the other way around, you know. Um, so you might get, you might be doing Columbo and get the wrong eye, you know. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Yarwood, I hope I'm not interrupting you. Then. But there's just one or two things that bother me. I never really gave people mannerisms, but I did exaggerate them. 
I mean, I used to do a thing with Harold Wilson where I'd leave the pipe in the mouth and then instead of taking it out, I'd just let it drop out of my mouth and he'd catch it. Sometimes you just get a round of applause on the stage. <laughs> I actually gave catchphrases to people, which really? is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I don't... <laughs> You see, Huey Green, Huey Green has never said, I mean that more sincerely, not to my knowledge. Max Bygraves has never said, I want to tell you a story. And as far as I know, Sir Harold has never said, and I said this at the Brighton Conference. The details such as the way Wilson let his eyes wander off for no apparent reason. You could not have made an animatronic Harold Wilson that was more accurate than the one Yarwood did in his own body, so to speak. It's, it's no secret, I think, you know, he's... He's, he does me better than I do myself, actually. <laughs> Mike Yarwood, when he became a character, could be that character for seven hours. He would be in rehearsal, he would go to the toilet, he would go to the canteen, he would be the person. And you can't believe, how does this man, no script, suddenly becomes the person, suddenly lives like him, thinks like him, orders the meal like him. And you're talking to the person all day. I never saw that in any other impressionist in the land. Too much of a good thing is wonderful. <laughs> On one occasion, he, as Bob Monk has, he did a joke about Max Bygraves. Now, as you know, Max Bygraves does not take criticism readily. Uh, I mean, I think once upon a time, Morecambe and Wise made a joke about Max Bygraves, and he went on the stage of the Palladium and talked about that short one with the fat legs and slagged them off. <laughs> and they never did a joke about Max again. So on this occasion, um, Max complained to Mike about this joke. And Mike said, what was the joke again? He said, no, 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 that wasn't me, that was Munker. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Bob and the Big Box Game. <laughs> the celebrities are going to put questions to me of which I have no previous knowledge. And I wouldn't say that if it wasn't true. Well, I would, but they wouldn't let me. <laughs> so could I have my first question, please, from Max? Dear Max Bygraves, what is your question? <laughs> Who sells more LPs than anybody else? And I'll give you a clue, Bob. You're looking at him. I actually feel more like the characters, actually, when I'm not wearing makeup, because I've got things stuck on me, you know. But um, I, I, I just feel as though I, I pitch that person in my head and I think you are now that person you you know uh, it, it's a bit like an actor might take on a role now is the Bernie Winters of our discontent made glorious by Susanna York <laughs> is this Mick Jagger that I see before me nay tis but Melvin Braggart <laughs> once Roger Moore into the breach dear friends once more or close Max Wall up with our English dead <laughs> Be you not frail, but hail, Russell Harty. <laughs> Let Karen and Ball blast their airs. <laughs> Follow your spirit, and upon this charge, cry God, Harry Seacom, England, and Boy George. There was a time when he even achieved even more difficult things, when he just took the voice of one and the physical of another. He would take the physicality of Harold Wilson with a hunch and the and and smoking the pipe, and then he would suddenly be Eddie Waring, but in the hunch and voice, and it was amazing. Could you imagine Harold saying, shut that door? <laughs> he would be two people at the very end of the show when we did the head turn, when one camera looked that way, we cut the other camera, he would talk to the people, and he was able to be... Uh, Harold Wilson talking to Robin Day, talking to Harold Wilson, talking to Robin Day. Now that leads us to the final question, who is the, uh, who is the best man to lead this country? Sir Harold Wilson. Well, I think you've just answered your own question. <laughs> there was more than just a voice. The face will change, the body language change. But what would uh, you, Sir Harold, what would you do if you found yourself in Foot's shoes? Limp. <laughs> That's the way I tell you that. <laughs> but to be serious for a moment, this sort of thing wouldn't have happened if I was still in power. Because when I was at number 10, and remember, I was a man who brought you a World Cup, two Eurovision Song Contests, and the, the artist summers we've ever had in Pisa. <laughs> yes, well, we've heard that, we've heard that. I wanted to take impressions a bit further. What can we do? We're doing Robin Day, we're doing Edward Heath, we're doing Harold Wilson. 
So I thought, what about ventriloquist dummies? Uh, Harold, don't forget we're on television, so uh, watch your P's and Q's. It's not my P's and Q's I'm worried about. It's your B's and W's. <laughs> if you're not careful, you'll have me saying, I've just had a gottle of gear and gred and gutter with Anthony Vegford Gen and Gargra Castle. <laughs> Another thing, I just saw your lips move. Well, at least when my lips move, I do say something. Oh, who's a cheeky little rogging tonight? <laughs> <laughs> you have to keep coming up with new devices and one of the most successful ones that I ever saw Mike doing was uh, he did a wonderful This Is Your Life where Powell was, was the subject and he got the other characters to comment on it hey, Come in, James Callahan. <laughs> Don't bother to get up, Harold. I wasn't going to. <laughs> Mr. Callahan, can you tell us some of the things you admire Sir Harold for? Well, first of all, his vitality and his ability to get up and go. <laughs> like last March, when he buzzed off and left me holding the baby. We used a device quite simply called split screen. And every time you saw Mike Yardwood, it, there was a soft edge split between him and somebody else. And you could have had five Mike Yarwoods all standing in a row. And how that was done was you'd have one recording, one videotape machine, play it back, add the next one, play it back, add the next one, play it back, add the next one. Those days were exhausting. I'd have to be this character, talk there, and then finish that one, go back into makeup, be in makeup another 45 minutes maybe, change the character, come back, and then slot that in. Hi, Bob, how are you? Ronnie, I feel like a hundred dollars. Oh, you mean a million dollars? No, a hundred. That's after tax. <laughs> At the end, he went barking mad, basically, trying to work out what pauses to make. And John Ammons would stand where you are now and go in the gap so that he would go, yes, hello, and wait for a reply that wasn't there to answer him. It used to send him mad because he never saw the end product till we edited it. Here we are on this gala show, both men of the eighties. Ow! I can't understand why we can't run the bit of tape that we're going to use. You know, why yeah, we're gonna... we had a sort of love-hate relationship. Really, it wasn't really hate. Can't go back to the beginning, obviously. No, this, gone back this, too I'm not satisfied. I've got to come out of this conversation winning. <laughs> you must always do, Mr. President. Well, here we are, fancy pair of dudes. They call you Dolly Parton for your gigantic boots. <laughs> Two from the movies, but that's in the past. And I've got the starring role at last. Two special people, oh, Ronnie and I. And here's where we have to say. Good night, Bob. Good night, sir. He made a tremendous impact because nobody really did politicians before him. Peter Cook had tried it, of course, in Beyond the Fringe, but regular primetime television, nobody did it. At one time or another, we've all had a go at running this country. Yet it's still in the same old mess. Sometimes I wonder where we went wrong. Well, speaking personally, of course, I never did. <laughs> One day in his house, we decided that uh, Harold Macmillan, the fr Prime Minister, was a good idea. And wh so what's funny about Harold Macmillan? And Mike said, I'll tell you what's funny about Ar Harold Macmillan. And he went in the kitchen and came out with this fixed lip, and we all just fell apart. What, what this country needs is more constitution, less destitution, and more prosperity. 
He wasn't satire. The point about Yarwood was that he was a brilliant impressionist. The jokes were pretty terrible. The scripts were not very good. They were the most basic old jokes about politicians being windbags, chances of the exchequer wanting to take all your money, that kind of thing. We had to wait for people like Bremner to combine the two. Mike was political in his own way. I think uh, Bill Cotton famously was quoted uh, being in a lift once at the BBC and somebody said, why don't we have satire on the BBC anymore? And Bill Cotton said, of course we have satire, we've got Mike Yarwood. And I remember at the time we thought, um, this was when Spitting Image was beginning, we thought, well, you know, there, 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 must, there must be a way of doing these characters in a more political sense because Mike Yarwood did Wilson, did Heath, did Callaghan, but I don't think he was a satirist. I don't think that was ever his intent. I think Mike Yarwood was an entertainer. <laughs> Oh, it says on the card that you like sailing. Yes, a life on the ocean wave. There isn't a soul in sight. I'm not surprised with a voice like that. <laughs> and as well as sailing, it says you like playing the organ, the piano, carol singing, conducting, and you were once prime minister. And once was enough. <laughs> he wanted to entertain, which was his job, his living. And uh, at the same time, he didn't want to upset the people that he was representing. And I think in that he succeeded. I would never have accused him of being unkind or uh, upsetting as far as I was concerned. I used to drive writers mad because uh, I'd say, oh, no, we can't, we can't say that. Or we can't do that. Of course you can. Of course you can. Why are you cutting that out? Oh, I don't want to say that. It's too cruel, you know. <laughs> he couldn't be savage because he wasn't a savage man. And we weren't really doing a savage program. We were doing a program that went out, I seem to remember... 8.30 or so on a Saturday night, and we went out on Christmas Day and we'd get all... I mean, the amazing thing is I still cherish the day we got 26.3 million on Christmas Day, which was... Now, you wouldn't get that if you were doing a savage show. If Michael Foote decided he would uh, sing, he would probably choose this song. It was friendly political humour. Put on your Sunday clothes when you feel down and out. Walk down the street and have your picture took. Get out your feathers, your paint and leathers, your beads, your buckles and bows. For there's no blue Monday in your Sunday. No blue Monday in your Sunday. It'll be fun day in your Sunday clothes. If you want to be satirical as an impressionist. You have to avoid being embraced by the establishment. I don't think Mike Howard ever managed that. Well, when, uh, when Sir Howard resigned, I, I, I don't know what it was. I, I thought you were going then for the moment. <laughs> I've been asked to tell you of my achievements during my premiership, and I have a list of them here. <laughs> A classic example, of course, was Dennis Healy. Now, Dennis Healy, in real life, was a pretty rough, tough, arrogant career and machine politician. If it moves, tax it. What Yarwood did was make him cuddly as well. Uh, that phrase, silly billy, which came to define Dennis Healy for a generation of us, was never uttered by Healy. I remember him going around a market somewhere during the election campaign and saying uh, to everybody he met, I suppose you're expecting me to say silly billy. Well, I'm not going to. Mike Yarwood invented that. It wasn't me at all. I've never said that. What a silly billy. <laughs> That's become almost as popular as didn't she do well and what a gay day. I did start using the phrase after Mike had used it as me. I never used the phrase before. I used other phrases beginning with S and V, like stupid bastards and silly so-and-so, you know. But, um, I ne but after he'd used it, then I often used it. Don't be a silly billy. <laughs> and suddenly out of this really bruising... Um ferocious, very pleased with himself politician, Mike Yarwood created this lovable pantomime figure. And that's one reason, I think, why Healy's memoirs went on to be incredibly successful. They sold in the, oh, a quarter of a million, something like that. No politician's memoirs sell like that. But what people were buying was not Dennis Healy's memoirs, they were buying Dennis Healy as performed by Mike Yarwood's memoir. Hello, I'm Dennis's sister. <laughs> No, of course, you'd never think it, would you? <laughs> anyway, shall we do the song? Yes, why not? <laughs> I'm Dennis. I'm Denise. He's a menace. He's a tease. 
I must say that he's rather good in matters of the state. But when he plays piano, I can roughly estimate. You couldn't even name that tune in under 68. I'm Dennis. <laughs> I'm Denise. My mother was very, very puzzled because she couldn't remember having a daughter. But she was about 95 at the time, so she could be forgiven for forgetting. Now his hobby's taking photographs, that's what he's always done. Last week he took one of himself, if only just for fun. He's hoping that they'll print it now on page three of the sun. <laughs> that's Dennis. <laughs> that's Dennis. Oh, what a silly filly. <laughs> now tonight I'm going to conduct the orchestra without the use of my arms. I'm going to do it with another part of my anatomy. <laughs> One, two, three, four. One of the funny things about Edward Heath is when he laughed, his shoulders went up and down. <laughs> and I first noticed it when uh, I was doing cabaret at a dinner at the Café Royal, uh, way, way back, and he, he turned up uh, to make a speech... But uh, he wasn't there for the dinner, so by the time he got there, I was in the middle of my act, and he walked in. And not only did he walk in in the middle of the act, I was actually doing Harold Wilson at that time, with the raincoat and the pipe in the mouth. So I watched him come in and walk to the top table. Of course, the audience are all sort of watching him. And uh, I just followed him across the waited, didn't say a word, and when he sat down, I said, I sincerely hope you haven't come in here to heckle. And, and then he went... I thought, oh, I've never seen him do that before. He obviously exaggerated it because that's part of the procedure, isn't it? And uh, I don't find myself doing it now. Perhaps I did it for some reason to amuse people or make them more tolerant. Ahoy there, my shipmates. <laughs> I haven't heaved them once talking to you. Well, say, you haven't given me any reason, but there you are. <laughs> Tell, tell me something, is Maggie coming on? No, 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 not Maggie. He can't do Maggie. <laughs> the turning point for Mike came when Margaret Thatcher came to power. Some of us here would like to be taken seriously. What do you do as an impressionist if your principal character, the Prime Minister, is one that you don't feel comfortable doing? I think you have to move on. You have to, as an impressionist, you have to move uh, with the times. Times change, you have to move with them. When Jim Callaghan lost the 1979 election, I thought, oh dear, now we've got a lady Prime Minister. What am I going to do? Mike, I don't think, could be a female character, um, realistically. He looked too much like a man in drag. I think Margaret Thatcher was the first one he was going to uh, try and tackle, and it just wouldn't work. That gave me the idea to start doing Prince Charles, actually, and Jimmy Carter, the American president. But if you've a half a mind to go into politics, that's all you need. <laughs> I haven't got a Prime Minister to do now, it's a woman, so I'll do the President and I'll do Prince Charles, and they were my VIPs. Uh, well, I suppose you're referring to me. I, <laughs> I knew you would sooner or later. But I, I should mention that Diana and I have always watched your programmes when we've got nothing better to do. Nobody had impersonated the royal family before. It's very hard for younger people to remember just how off-limits how revered the royal family was. And along came Yarwood and made fun of these people. And a peaceful new year. Oh, you didn't wait for the credits. <laughs> What's the point, dear? We know who it is. Now, it was all done in a very nice way. The viciousness came much later. The, uh, the Queen Mum was a gin-sodden drunk, for example. We had to wait for spitting image for that. And, and Yarwood's royal family were basically pretty reverential. They were nice. I can't imagine any member of the royal family seeing them and taking offence. But they were still pretty revolutionary at the time. It gives me enormous pleasure to <laughs> declare these curtains open. You see just how accurate and good his Prince Charles was. What a splendid day it is, it really is. Ah, tea. <laughs> the wonderful, sweet, winning diffidence of Prince Charles, you know, who is a smarter cookie than a lot of people present, certainly isn't a madman. And um, as certain tabloid proprietors would have us believe, um, and Mike Yarwood managed to get that, that charming, winning diffidence, which also had a little bit of um, 
knowingness about it. It was just very accurate. Where's the letter opener? It's his day off. Nobody knew about that and at that point. That was a, a big bonus for me because nobody knew quite what to expect. Whereas all the characters that Mike's done are mega stars. And so for, therefore when he has to recreate them, he has to create them so carefully. But for me, I don't think people really knew much about Di at that point other than the head um, and perhaps the nails. And that, that was all I had. Where's my soldiers? They're outside, marching up and down. <laughs> no, I mean you've forgotten the toast. Sorry. The Queen. <laughs> And Princess Diana he said, I loved the sketch in the kitchen. I actually cried laughing. She said, it takes a lot to make me cry laughing, but, you know, I cried laughing at that. I felt really good about that. I thought, you know, if they liked it, well, that's the first time I've told that. Mom, can I ask you what you're hoping Prince Charles is going to give you this Christmas? Well, I really don't know. But last year he gave me something very beautiful. May I ask what that was? Cornwall. <laughs> Of course, being a typical woman, she took it back and changed it for Devon. <laughs> almost there, we're almost there. How wonderful, wonderful are we for you, for me. When Mike Yarwood thought he was a singer, Mike Yarwood sang in key, perfectly tonally correct, perfectly phrased. But when Mike Yarwood sang as Mike Yarwood, it was terrible. It wasn't that terrible, it just wasn't in key. I used to do one of Gracie Fields, and if, if the pianist at rehearsal had asked me to sing something as myself and had said it's going up to top C, I would say, oh, no, oh I, couldn't, I couldn't do that. I couldn't. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I'll, I'll go down here and take it down a key. But once you're the person, once you're into it, you lose all of that. And you go flying and you do the thing. And he would do that because he was being Sinatra. My little town blues are melting away. It was a lot of self-indulgence, really, because uh, Sinatra is my idol. You know, and Sammy Davis. I'll make a brand new start of it in old New York. I never claimed that I had a, a you know, a, a great Sinatra voice, but I, I used to imitate more the way he sang a song and the way he phrased things. New York, New York. And uh, the same with Sammy Davis. New York. My kind of home. Yeah. He's truly a modest man, so therefore you don't deal with ego or the problems that go with stardom. More in truth, a matter of convincing him how good he is in himself. Like an awful lot of impressionists, the real Mike Yarwood lies very far back in his personality. Being yourself is the hardest thing that you do as an impressionist. And... Being yourself in real life is hard to do as an impressionist. Being yourself on television is even harder. I, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. I wanted to start years ago as an impressionist and then become a comedian and develop my own personality. It didn't work, because there isn't really a me. <laughs> there was always a certain tragic feel to, to, to Mike, I felt. Um, you know, he, 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 he never seemed to get it the balance quite right, you know, his, his, his home life and his professional life and everything else. And he, he lacked a certain amount of confidence in, in his ability, which undoubtedly was enormous. It's a paradox that my most successful years were the 70s, and yet possibly when looking back, were I, I look back with a lot of, sadness and unhappiness. Uh, <clears throat> uh, my drinking was out of control uh, most of the time. I mean, I was on and off it and trying to, you know, I was, in the earlier part I was younger and I could cope a little bit better, but then it, it, it got bad. And I was working, I was working too much. I was doing maybe six television shows a year, plus a Christmas show, plus a summer season, plus nightclubs 
and everything got to the point where, God, I needed a drink. <laughs> I was drinking far too much. I missed a lot of the children growing up. Uh, I missed, not so much I missed them growing up, but I missed certain occasions. Uh, one of the saddest things I can think of is I missed my first daughter's first birthday <clears throat> because I was, I, was, I was too hungover, you know. I hate that, I hate thinking about that. But I was so hungover, I couldn't, you know, attend my daughter's first birthday. Claire and I were probably aware from day one that there was something not quite right in terms of drink and daddy. Um, I think as a, as a young child, my mother was absolutely excellent at keeping us normal and um, hiding us from anything that might have, you know, been too difficult to cope with. But... Um, I certainly knew by the age of about five or six that, that alcohol and my dad didn't mix. I first realised I had a dependence on drink is when I, I di when I discovered that it was its own antidote, that I needed it in the morning to take away the, the horrors that the drinking the night before had done. There's a whole blurred period when, when it was really at its worst and after my parents split up, it very much fell on the shoulders of, of Charlotte and I to, to support Daddy, because I think my mum, bless her, had, had taken all she could up to that point. And um, so after that, Charlotte and I really became like parents to him and, and tried to, to, to help him through. The show ran for 16 consecutive years. And the pressure was on all the time. Is it going to be funny? Are the scripts OK? Am I doing too many shows? Uh, new ideas? You wanted new ideas all the time. He went through uh, personal torments which were caused by his demand for perfection. And that demand for perfection and getting the funniest laugh and getting the show, the hit show, meant that in a way outside the television studio, he torched himself. The show had fallen in the ratings, let's be honest about that. I mean, the show had fallen in the ratings. And I don't think I was as sharp as I was. I don't think that, you know, I was running out of characters. We were running out of ideas for good material. Um, and it was time for a rest anyway. But the only thing was, it's like you've got a good parking space, you know. Uh, don't move the car unless you have to, because when you come back, somebody else may be parked there. And that's what happened to me. I don't know why he's not on. I do know, for instance, that his John Major, which I think we did on Dares on occasion, and he did on a royal show, was better than any I've ever seen. It was perfect. Good evening. <laughs> I'm sitting at Mrs Thatcher's old desk. But first off, let me make it clear that I am not stepping into her shoes. High heels make me wobble when I walk. <laughs> but as your Prime Minister, I will strain every sinew to try and bring down the terribly high rate of inflation that I have inherited from the last Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> but I deserve to win, because whereas Michael Heseltine and Douglas Hurd are both extremely rich, I am very poor. So I'm better qualified to reside in 10 Downing Street, which is, strictly speaking, a council house. <laughs> People say to me, you know, Mike, nobody, you don't appear on television anymore. It's all gone pear-shaped and this, that and the other. The important thing is I'm happy, you know, and the important thing is I'm sober. And, and I've got two wonderful children who, who are a great joy to me. You are the sunshine of my life. That's why I'll always be around. I think for many years he's felt the need to come back and somehow draw a line under it properly, close it properly. Um, whereas I think that's not necessary. I think he's happier not working. I think he deserves to retire. I think he, he did his bit for long enough. And you are the apple of my eye. Forever you stay in my heart. We've just celebrated ten years of um, him not having had a drink. And, uh, you know, that, I never saw that coming. I never thought we would be in a place where we could say that. So we're very proud of him. I feel like this is the beginning. Though I've loved you for one million years. 
if I thought our love was ending I would have drowned myself, drowning in my own tears When I was a young man, I said to myself, when a young man in show business, I said, I do not want to become a bitter old pro, you know, walking around with a toupee on his head, moaning, I, I don't get any work. He should be here now. This fellow, what's his name? This fellow, uh, what's his name? Yeah, but he should be here. No. <laughs> They're walking him round the block. Yes. <laughs> if I go into an imitation in company, it's usually Frankie Howard. So I think Frankie Howard must be my favourite. Did you hear that? Did you hear it? <laughs> oh, you're so what a sauce. Mind you, I, no, listen, no, I had to titter myself, I had to titter. He played a prominent part in our society for that time. And, um, well, if there is a possibility of him coming back in that field, I, amongst many, would welcome it. He could come back and do the most wonderful special. He could come back and do the most wonderful special. But if I never step on a stage again for the rest of my life, I've had a wonderful career. He does add to the gaiety of nations, and I think we all, all owe him a debt of gratitude for that. Her name was Lola. <laughs> she was a sugar, with yellow feathers in her hair, and her dress cut down to there. She would be ringing and do the chop chop. And while she tried to be a star, Timmy always came to bar across the crowded floor. They went from like watching the person themselves except the other great thing was there was a, a look in his eyes a kind of gleam in Yarwood's eyes that says I'm not Harold Wilson I'm not Ted Heath I'm just Mike Yarwood having a wonderful time and that double thing Yarwood peeking out if you like from behind the mask which he had created was what gave it the particular charm and an edge for what is a man what has he got if not himself he has not to say the things he really feels and not the words of one who kneels to record shows I took the blows this is me and did it more